Haiti, 13th of January 2010. Al Jazeera's team was one of the very first on the ground, arriving the day after the earthquake struck and tore Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, apart. The scenes that greeted us on arrival and the events of the following days and weeks were heartbreaking. This is where people have come to sleep. They say they're afraid to go back into their houses. They think something else might happen. Al Jazeera has been here since the earthquake. These people are trying to leave the city. They say they're tired of waiting for humanitarian efforts to kick into action. And it's been my job to document and report from this country as it confronts the aftermath of the disaster. This is what much of the UN presence actually looks like on the streets of Port-au-Prince. Men in uniform, racing around in vehicles, carrying guns. The international emergency response teams have left now. The shock and adrenaline of those first few days is long gone. The dust is settling here, and as it does, the deep fractures that run through this country are re-emerging, more gaping than ever before. In Port-au-Prince, everywhere you go, there's rubble. Broken concrete and shattered bricks. Much of Port-au-Prince looks exactly the same way as it did just days after the earthquake hit. This kind of scene where a university was reduced to rubble, it's the kind of thing we saw when we first arrived. Six months on, the rubble is still there. It's thought that around 200,000 buildings came down in the quake, creating more than 20 million cubic meters of rubble. With just 300 trucks currently being used to cart it all away, it's going to take about six years to clear this up. And as you move around Port-au-Prince, there's almost no rebuilding going on either. Companies like the Florida-based Ashbrit Incorporated are waiting and lobbying for the massive construction contracts that will inevitably be handed out by the Haitian government. But six months on, few major reconstruction contracts have been awarded. While the company waits for contracts, more than one and a half million people are living in over 1,200 camps most of them under tarpaulins. We've visited dozens of camps like these in the last six months, and we've spoken to hundreds of people living in them. Everywhere you go, the anger is the same. It's been six months now since the earthquake. Tell us about how bad is the situation now. The situation has been complicated for us, the period for us, before the period we Do you think the politicians, do you think the NGOs, do you think they really understand what kind of a, a situation you're living in now? The NGOs, as well as the government, they know the situation. If you want to block the situation, if you want to get rid of the people, you can do it. When the earthquake struck, the world was stunned by the pictures of Haiti's collapsed presidential palace. We were in this ferry square just 24 hours after the earthquake hit. Back then, none of these shelters were here, just thousands of terrified people huddled together to try to get through the night. Six months on, many things have changed about the way this place looks, but there's one aspect of life that remains the same. Luina Alabre lost her husband in the earthquake. Just three days later, her 14-year-old daughter Falond was attacked by a group of men. Luina Alabre lost her husband in the earthquake. 
la crier me dit oh so gien on peut décrire quoi so gien quand on vient sans ça yo il dit oui pas capable parler non pas capable parler pas capable parler l'elle vient connia il est à l'abdim c'est trois messieurs qui viennent il y aura les âmes met sous lui et puis il dit le constat il prend le bouche figuil et puis trois messieurs ont fait quoi sous lui assassiner le net in may luina herself was raped when she went to use the latrines the attackers were hiding inside connia et puis il y aura les âmes et maintenant j'aurai moi Yo dim si me fait bruit y a tiré me. Yo ta aime mon patronne. While there have been no thorough surveys and no official statistics, those working with rape survivors say that assaults in the camps are on the rise. Here, at a legal office in downtown Port-au-Prince, at least six different Haitian women's groups meet to work out ways to protect women in the camps and provide support for survivors, many of whom come here for emergency medical and psychological care. I don't know if there's an ONG that can help in a situation of violence for women. I don't know if there's an ONG that can help in a situation of violence. Mais qui peut chercher un gens qui pour éviter ou bien qui pour chercher une structure à un gouvernement qui pour aider nous diminuer tout de violence au, au jour le jour violence en vient plus. The leaders of at least one of the organizations Favelec told us they've not received any assistance from international NGOs. Bonsoir. The Favelec organizers took us to the Savan Pistache camp where there've been numerous cases of rape and violent assaults on women in the past six months. Here, they introduced us to 14-year-old Maudeline Derival. Two months ago, she was sleeping with her mother in their shelter. At four in the morning, a man broke in with a gun and a machete. He told Maudeline's mother that if she called for help, he'd kill her daughter. He then took Maudeline to a nearby ruined house, put a gun to her head and raped her. When her father went to the police, they told him it wasn't their problem. A few shelters down, and we heard another story. They came with machetes. When they no, we're not capable to do like this. This woman told us her home had recently been broken into. The only security this woman had was this tarpaulin stretched over the entrance to her tent. Ça tombe. On est mal à qui ça lié. The man who came in slashed it with a razor. He told her that if she didn't have sex with him, he'd kill her. She was relatively lucky. She managed to call for help, and the man fled. They're hoping that these testimonies will eventually make criminal investigations possible, in spite of the apparent indifference of the Haitian police. And while we saw no Haitian police here, we did find the symbols of international protection, the United Nations flag and blue helmets. Can we speak to the commander? This base houses some of the UN's 10,000 strong force. I'm going to tell them that there are cases of rape that are going on every night in this camp and just ask them what they're trying to do about it, right? We tried putting the women's concerns to the base's Sri Lankan commander. How do they contact you? How, how, I mean, if there are cases of rape going on at night and you guys are right here, can you not help? Oh, gentlemen, don't take the video here. Understood? Okay. Well, the commander's told me that neither he nor his soldiers are actually allowed to even speak to the civilian population of this camp without permission from his commanding officer. Uh, he's given me the name of somebody at a UN base some distance from here, but he wouldn't give out a telephone number, and there's no way for these residents to even communicate with the soldiers who are living in this base. It's a disconnect between the international community in Haiti and the people they're here to help. And we saw it again on a night patrol with UN police. This is one of the biggest camps in Port-au-Prince. There's a plentiful supply of floodlights and electricity. That's not always the case in all of the other camps around the city. In addition to the lights, the UN is hoping that these officers, members of a newly arrived contingent of 600 female Bangladeshi police, will make it safer here and easier for women to report violence. But like most of the UN police force in Haiti, the Bangladeshis don't speak the local language Creole or even French, making meaningful communication with the camp residents impossible. A couple of days ago, we were in a camp where women were complaining of rapes going on every single night. Mm -hmm. um, rapes? No, no, that's not true. 
It was a very yeah. big camp. They were, I mean, we, we spoke to people that, that are saying there were, there were incidents on a very regular basis. But actually, we don't have any information about mm -hmm. rapes every night, for okay. sure. But when girls and women are being assaulted under the noses of international peacekeepers, and so many thousands languish under the elements in ill-lit IDP camps, it's no surprise that across this city you meet people who feel angry and abandoned by international NGOs and the United Nations. There is a, a lot of hostility on the street towards the presence of NGOs. I mean, it must make things more difficult for you uh, to, to kind of have... Uh, uh, I, I don't agree with that term of hostility on the streets against NGOs or international community. Well, everywhere you go you see graffiti saying down with the NGOs, NGOs are thieves and down with the UN. Everywhere? Pretty much every neighborhood in Port-au-Prince yeah, has graffiti. No, I, I don't agree with that assessment. I don't see that. It's uh, some groups, you, min mi maybe some minority groups. Have you seen any of that? Politically motivated, maybe, at this point, but I don't think it really reflects the sentiment of the people of Haiti. Do you think there's um, been a lack of focus on this transitional period? And do you think you've well, maybe I, taken your eye off the ball? I, as I said a while ago, I think that we did lose the sense of urgency that was there in the very beginning. And as I said, I think we have to re-energize that, and we're doing that right now. In my six months here, what I've seen is a massive gulf between people from the UN and NGOs and the people they're here to help. It's an economic divide and a social one. Most nights, the fanciest bars and clubs of Port-au-Prince are packed with foreign aid workers. This is nothing new. It was like this before the January the 12th quake but it adds to the perception that many international organizations no longer see this as an emergency, that it's back to business as usual. And just meters away from the dancing of the cocktails, in the camps, there are more than one and a half million people trying to sleep as the rain pours in. Camp Coray lies far on the outskirts of Port-au-Prince. More than an hour's drive from the city centre. This is a model camp, the one the Haitian government wants everyone to see. Uniform and well spaced out as they are, the tents here won't stand up to the strong winds that come every hurricane season. This is the fiberglass around the ferro there. They snapped at these ferros just there. In six months, just one temporary shelter has been built. This flimsy plywood house is supposed to withstand a Category 1 hurricane, with winds gusting up to 150 kilometers an hour. So this is it. This is the temporary shelter. For the hurricane protection, what do you think? How's it going to stand up? I don't know. While the official camp is home to just over 5,000 refugees, some 40,000 more have fled here from Port-au-Prince after the quake. These squatters have marked out their own plots of land with rocks and sticks and set up makeshift shelters. But they told us that police had come just a couple of days ago, slashed their tarpaulins and told them to vacate the land. Well, it looks like the roof has also been slashed with machetes and there's rain now coming into the shelter. This is supposed to be one of the few plots of land owned by the Haitian government, but it sounds like local police are enforcing the interests of private land speculators. Land tenure is one of the major issues holding up reconstruction and resettlement. What has happened uh, from the inception 
of the Haitian state is that a little group of people have grabbed land. For the past six months, Patrick Ali has worked as an advisor to President René Preval. Sixteen years ago, he served as Aristide's defense minister. So for years, he's had a front row view as foreign influences, governments and banks dictated policy to the Haitian state. What was done over the years since uh, uh, the late 70s and early 80s was to chip away whatever was left of the state, okay? By, for example, instead of asking for state-owned company to clean up their act and be productive, to sell them to private sector. And what has happened in Haiti is that internationally funded NGOs have filled the empty space left vacant by a weakened state. La situation que nous connaissons avec les ONG jusqu'à présent, c'est une situation que nous décrivons comme étant l'État dans l'État. Twice a former prime minister of Haiti and tipped to run for president soon, Jacques Edouard Alexis is intimately acquainted with the workings of the government's competition and its failures. Mais on a vu, de par l'expérience des ONG en Haïti, qu'il n'y a pas de développement. Je crois que nous devons faire en sorte que les ONG puissent rentrer dans le jeu qui est défini par l'État ici. According to the current Prime Minister Jean-Max Berrive, it's about to happen. The new Interim Haiti Recovery Commission will decide how the $5.3 billion pledged by international donors will be used to rebuild and try to bring NGOs in line with government priorities. Half its voting members are Haitian, the other half represent foreign donors. Before the commission, 100% of the money pledged on Haiti was decided by the one giving it. So it's a brief progress that we get to 50%. <laughs> so we are ga gaining on our sovereignty. But if Haiti has been granted the license to rebuild as a sovereign state, who will be able to govern it? Presidential elections in Haiti are scheduled in just four months' time, and opposition leaders are starting to make noises and setting out their political strategies. Businessman Charles Baker was a leader of Group 184, the US-funded coalition that helped oust Aristide. He ran against Preval in 2006, winning 8% of the vote. He plans to run again. If we'd have had a, a responsible government, a responsible president, uh, definitely things have gone much better. Baker questions the Preval government's ability to run fair elections and is demanding a complete revamping of the CEP, the council that will oversee them. If President Preval sticks to that, you might see uh, a repetition of 2006, of 2004, where President Preval might have to leave power under popular pressure, which is not the best thing for Haiti. I think it'll be a lot quicker than uh, what happened with Aristide because there are a lot more frustrations. It'll probably take less than a month. And it's playing out in the streets too. Almost every week since the earthquake, I've covered protests like this one. for the most part orchestrated and paid for by politicians to destabilize Preval's government. It's not hard to find evidence. Just outside the presidential palace, we meet Carlos Jean Charles. Well, the protests, we have a two group, you know. We have a group against Preval, we have a group in favor of Preval, you know. Because the protests in Haiti, the rich people, they pay us, you know, to make violence. Nobody protests without money in this country. You know, I can receive just that. Uh, 500 sometimes or mm. 600, depend on the demonstration, you know. To go out and demonstrate. Yeah, to go out, you know. If the demonstration was gone, I can receive just like 1,500. Carlos points us into the Champ de Mars camp, where he says we'll meet people paid to protest for the other side, the Preval government. Sure enough, we find 23-year-old Francisco Ligonde, who told us he's the leader of the 69-member Love Alliance gang. 
We are all, that's me, we all the smoke keep Weval. Yes. Weval, we like Weval. And when you protest, do you get paid yes. for demonstrating? Yes. Yeah. We are, yeah. His crew shows us the wounds and battle scars received in the line of duty. How much do they pay for a demonstration? Like, how much do they get paid? So, like 200 gold? Uh, 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 22. 22. Okay. 22 dollars US? No, Asian. Asian. Okay. You, you have a boss for your, 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 your group? Yes, I mean, I'm a boss. Okay. You're the boss? Yeah. So where, where do you get the money from? So, you know, I know, but I cannot say you. Can't say it. I cannot say you. Okay, man. More than 20 years ago, a massive social justice movement swelled with Haiti's dispossessed people. It was called Lavalas, meaning the flood, and it swept Aristide to power in the country's first democratic elections. Two decades and two coups d'etat later, the Fanmi Lavalas party is what remains of that movement. Plagued by infighting, it hasn't named a presidential candidate yet and the Preval government may bar it from running one. But Fan Mi Lavalas can still mobilize thousands with calls for Aristide's return, and it's proven as much in the months since the earthquake. If the country makes it through November's elections, the new government will bear the burden of rebuilding this country. Some in Haiti recognize the challenges, but hold out hope. I put all my money on our ability at the grassroots movement to remobilize the Haitian people, to make them believe once more that they are the key players in politics and that they should get involved in politics. Others have more dire predictions. Oh, after the call, you're going to see blood everywhere. That's why, you know, the witch people, they just keep us in misery to make us, you know, do whatever they want. Six months on from the earthquake, this disaster continues to unfold. A disaster made worse by political and economic choices as far beyond the control of the vast majority of Haitians as the shifting tectonic plates beneath them. And I wonder what kind of ground-shaking event it would take for those with power here to change their habits of doing business and politics and providing aid so that rebuilding can begin in earnest for the people who need it most.